Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula is a place rich in wildlife and steeped in history. Where a god of hurricanes exposes the beaches and a goddess of fertility populates them, creating the island of the women. But it's not only humans with ancient rituals of birthing and motherhood here. It's a place of transformations where a shapeless giant sea monster troubling the coastline can become a golden floating rainforest and where the sands can bloom with the tiniest of turtles on the living beach. The magnificent frigate bird is a perfect pilot, spending most of its life above the beaches and in the air. It kites through Mexican skies with long, narrow wings spanning seven feet. A white patch on her neck, breast, and belly distinguishes the female of the species as do her maternal instincts. A magnificent frigate bird will care for her fledglings for more than a year after they've hatched, one of the greatest durations of any bird. She might ride these skies for a week unbroken with very little rest, scanning the oceans in order to feed her young. Here, on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula and its neighboring islands, there are many such stories of nurturing, birthing, and creation. One of the first of these stories comes from the ancient Mayans who lived here long ago. They believed that the god Huracan blew a gusting wind over the surface of the ocean, ripping away its waters and exposing the land for the very first time. After the beaches and land came the plants and animals, and then the people with their great stone cities and temples. To the Mayans, the storm god Huracan whose name is the source of our modern word hurricane, was seen not as a force of destruction, but ultimately as a force of creation. Another life-changing Mayan deity was Ishel, a protective goddess of birth and fertility, medicine and healing. Today, a short boat ride from Cancun still reveals a beach island of worship and sanctuary called Isla Mujeres. For those who once prayed to this Earth Mother. The Mayas dedicate this island to the god of the fertility, who is the Ischel god. Filled with images of the goddess, Isla Mujeres is Spanish for Island of the Women. On the beaches of this feminine refuge, another species plays out a nightly ancient birthing ritual during the fertile months of summer. The female green sea turtle has been swimming to the island of the women for thousands of years. It's interesting that turtles, much like marine mammals and seabirds, um, they live in the open ocean, but they uh, come to shore and come onto the beach, come onto land to breed. They're not that far away from their evolutionary history. They still have to use the land for breeding and for the early part of their life cycle. Every May to September, these gentle giants seek the sands here in order to lay their eggs.
This little beach is called Playa Angar. And in the dark of night, green sea turtles transform it into cradles for their nesting. This behavior is difficult to film, as artificial light can be a deterrent for the mature animals, making them less likely to nest on a particular beach. And these beach habitats are precious, as the green turtle, like most sea turtles, is an endangered species. It's because these turtles and their eggs are so endangered that these human conservationists are on hand. Buried turtle eggs are vulnerable to predators, off-roading vehicles, high tropical storms, and more. Collecting eggs in order to protect them during their delicate incubation period is part of the mission of Tortugraña volunteers like these ones. With the permission of this government-sponsored group, highly sensitive cameras capture the nesting turtles in the softest possible light. A mature green sea turtle can be the circumference of a small tabletop, but weigh as much as an upright piano. Most frequently, her nesting will happen at night, when it's cooler and quieter for the animal. Once she's hauled herself up on the beach, beyond the reach of high tide, the turtle digs a body pit. Using all four flippers, she excavates a huge volume of sand. An exhausting process that can take almost half an hour. Cradled in her body pit, the green sea turtle now begins to dig an even deeper hole for her egg chamber. Deep enough to ensure her eggs won't be washed away by the rising tide. She does this using only her back flippers. The green turtle raises her back flippers and begins a series of contractions. With every contraction, she lays multiple eggs into the sand. The people who assist in this process are like midwives, in keeping with the tradition of the Mayan goddess for whom the island was named. Entonces cuando la tortuguita escarba, está escarbando, ya que ven que se queda quietecita, se va por atrás muy despacito para que no, no la asuste. Though it might seem like this turtle is weeping tears during her birthing process, she's actually taking the opportunity to secrete excess salts accumulated from her time swimming in the ocean. By the time she's finished, she will have laid between 100 and 150 eggs. A collection of eggs like this is known as a clutch. These volunteers collect the eggs for the turtle's benefit, to protect the next generation of the animal from possible early harm. The volunteers will take these eggs back to the Tortugraña, a turtle sanctuary. There, they'll bury the eggs all over again, for a number of good reasons. A buried clutch allows the egg embryos to remain at optimal temperatures. Studies indicate that warmer nests tend to produce female hatchlings, while colder nests tend to produce males. Burying the clutch also allows the eggs to remain moist, rather than drying out, exposed to the elements. Each egg is close to the size of a ping pong ball and lacks a hard shell. Their spongy nature allows them to drop into the nest without cracking. Finally, burying the eggs helps protect them from hungry predators, ranging from crabs to raccoons. A turtle's egg is a delicacy for such predators, and for humans too. Mayans of the Yucatan ate turtle eggs, as well as their meat, for thousands of years. Beyond any dietary value, turtle eggs have been long eaten for mythical reasons. Even in the 21st century, 
Despite no scientific evidence, myths persist that eating a turtle's egg is a powerful aphrodisiac and a boost for male fertility. But for the turtles that come to the beaches at Isla Mujeres, the humans who greet them here aren't predators, but caregivers. Y la mujer es el primer lugar donde por muchos tiempos eh, se ha cuidado la tortuguita. Como 30 años que llevamos con el programa, de, somos pioneros de, acá, de, de cuidar este, este animalito. Mother Green Sea Turtles perform their birthing feats more than once in a season. Que una tortuga de mayo a octubre desova cinco o seis veces. La primera vez es muy alta. Después hasta que sube por ocho o diez huevos. Y aunque tire ocho huevos, es el mismo trabajo que hace, el mismo ritual. In an average season, the Tortugraña volunteers might assist over a thousand nesting sea turtles. With an estimate of 100 eggs each, over the full nesting season, this can potentially be 100,000 new offspring. Tortugraña volunteers collect the clutches of eggs into simple, recyclable carryalls, giving whole new meaning to a clutch purse. Midnight midwifery complete for the evening. These volunteers prepare to return to the Tortugraña Turtle Sanctuary. Mother green sea turtles do not raise their young. Having laid her eggs, her work here is finished. This beach is a primal, special place for her. It's likely, in fact, that this is the exact same beach from which she was hatched some 20 to 50 years ago. Now, in her sexual maturity, she's been drawn back to the location, pinpointing it from potentially an ocean away. What is most mysterious to us is that um, these, these turtles may come out of an egg, crawl into the ocean, and disappear for 20 years, swim right across the Atlantic, then come back in a huge circle of thousands of kilometers, and they go back to the very same beach where they hatched and where they spent minutes of their life, go exactly back to the same beach to lay their eggs. And it's a mystery how they can find their way from across the world, literally speaking, to that one place that, uh, that they call home. There's growing research lending credibility to the notion that sea turtles have something of a compass in their brains, letting them detect Earth's magnetic field. Should fate or ancient Mayan goddesses be kind, this green sea turtle's hatchlings will also carry Playa Angar Beach as an internal lodestone a lodestone that will never leave them for all of the 80 years a lucky sea turtle might live its life. The pregnant sands of the Island of the Women are also nesting grounds for another reptile, the northeastern spiny tail iguana. It lays its eggs in the beach and basks on warm rocks. Frigate birds wheeling in the skies above. There are many subspecies of spiny tail iguana. The generic name for them all is Stenosaura, 
which come from the Greek words meaning comb and lizard. And the spines running down their backs certainly do look like bristles of a grooming comb. This particular northeastern spiny tail seems caught in the middle of a grooming mishap. Its chin resembling a man's after a shaving cut with a piece of blotting tissue hanging off the wound. But it's actually just in the process of shedding skin. It's a frequent and healthy, albeit patchy, occurrence as the animal continues to grow. The spiny tail iguana is the world's fastest lizard. In short bursts, it can run at speeds over 18 miles per hour. The species ranges from Mexico's east coast, found in places like tiny Isla Mujeres, as well as high traffic, touristy Cancun. This head bobbing is a territorial display. The animal is defending its space against intruders, like this great tailed grackle. The collective term for a flock of noisy grackles is an annoyance. And this solitary bird certainly seems to be annoying the spiny tail. Or maybe the iguana is simply hungry. It's primarily a herbivore, but it's also an opportunistic eater and won't pass up meat when given the chance. As the crab emptied from this shell might attest. Mexico's natural history plays out everywhere, even in the middle of a man-made beach. The beach here at Cancun is big business. This epic stretch of white sand first attracted a resort area in the 1970s. Hotels were built to straddle the dunes of this barrier island. But as wind and waves continually blasted this shore, the sand scoured away and threatened the postcard perfect views. To compensate, more than 70 million US dollars have been spent dredging nearby sandbars to sustain this unsustainable situation. With the volume of sand imported here to date, you could build almost eight sandcastles of the Empire State Building to scale. But real wildlife still occupies this artificial shoreline. It doesn't ruffle the brown pelican's feathers being so close to humankind. The brown pelican appears ungainly as it waddles along the beach but it's another story when the pelican takes flight to forage for food. It dive bombs between bathers, filling its bill and finding the shallows are generous with fish. The brown pelican lets the water drain from its throat pouch, then swallows down its shuddering treat. Some tourists consider the pelican population to be a nuisance. Like seagulls, they're birds that congregate around human food scraps and can leave a lot of droppings on the beach. 
but far more damaging to the Mexican beach experience might be this real-life sea monster beneath the bird's feet. Piles and piles of sargassum seaweed. In recent years, this thick, red-brown seaweed has been clogging the boundary between beach and sea in record-setting amounts. Because it reproduces asexually, some consider it to be one big creature, the largest organism in the world. Putrefying in the heat, this monster seaweed can make your eyes water with a smell like rotten eggs. Lines of sargassum trace the Mexican coast. For the hotel industry, these are lines of battle because this means war. When you live on a pristine white beach and you've never seen these species come to the shoreline before in large masses and they, they, they reek and they, they make the beach largely unusable, it's, a, it's an economic factor. It's clearly something that would bother people. If this had been an annual occurrence all along, there would be no hotel in the first place. Hoteliers spend staggering amounts of money, increasingly each year, to rid their beachfronts of sargassum. Or, as it's also negatively labeled, golf weed. Newspapers run dramatic headlines like, Sargassum seaweed terrorizes beaches in the Caribbean. But in its natural habitat, the seaweed plays a vital role in the ecology of Mexico's coastal waters. Each individual strand of sargassum can grow almost the length of a school bus. Where Mother Nature weaves these strands together, the floating mats are incredibly large, several football fields long. In one particular area of the Atlantic Ocean, these great mats can bump into other great mats almost without interruption. This is the Sargasso Sea. It's actually a very special place and it's on the list of places to be protected um, because it's so unique in terms of the seaweed floating around but also the fish and invertebrate and birds and mammals and all kinds of life forms associated with that seaweed. It's a really important place. It has been called quite poetically, I think, uh, the floating rainforest of the sea. The Sargasso Sea is actually named after the seaweed because it's got so much sargassum floating around. Within this huge body of water, islands of the vegetation make for a constant patchy sight. The Sargasso Sea is a vast area of open ocean about two million square miles or three million square kilometers in extent. So it's a large body of water and it's special because it's fairly enclosed in that there's a current that goes around. That system of currents is known as the North Atlantic Gyre. Surrounding the Sargasso Sea, this gyre is made up of the North Atlantic Current on the north, the Canary Current on the east, the Atlantic North Equatorial Current on the south, and finally, the Gulf Stream on the west. Bound inside this gyre, the Sargasso is the only sea in the world that doesn't touch land. The seaweed mats within the Sargasso mostly churn in place, as if agitated in a giant washing machine. Rather than some monstrous thing, it's a golden floating jungle, ripe in biomass. The sargassum fields are important nursery grounds for a number of species, particularly fish species such as mahi-mahi, for example, or dolphin fish, and uh, sea turtles, most, most definitely uh, green turtles, also loggerhead sea turtles, use it as important juvenile grounds to grow up, like a kindergarten of the sea, if you will, but a floating kindergarten, which is kind of neat. 
From a kindergarten of the sea to a kindergarten on land, this Tortugraña, or Turtle Sanctuary, back at Isla Mueres, is on the brink of its brand new hatching event. Every 45 to 60 days, enrolling succession on the calendar, turtle eggs complete their incubations here, cared for by conservation officers and volunteers. Like the shift in perception that needs to happen towards sargassum, this is a culture shift in our relationship with a needlessly hunted animal. La gente que sigue comiendo los huevecillos, pero afortunadamente aquí es veda permanente. Aquí hay gente que se le sorprenda matando una tortuga, comiendo un huevecillo, eh, se puede ir a la cárcel por varios años o se le multa muy fuerte. Solo así podemos continuar con cada vez que haya más tortuguitas. Aquí se le cuida mucho, afortunadamente. Tortugraña is an incubator for the unborn, a kindergarten for the newly hatched, and a hospital for the injured or infirm. In this way, it is, again, a temple of sorts, on an island once filled with temples to the protective goddess of birthing and healing. Every one of these handwritten signs is a sign of rebirth for a species whose population numbers are critically dwindled. Una tortuga llega a desovar un promedio de 130 huevos. Aquí nace un 85% en cautiverio. Clutches of eggs from Playa Angar Beach become buried treasures once they arrive here. Each carefully itemized and accounted for. Número de huevos y en la playa, hangar. La fecha, 30 de junio. Sí. Y así cada, cada nido, así va el número de huevos en la playa en que fue, fueron rescatados los huevecillos. Sí, a cada rato hay que checarlo. When a clutch's predicted date of hatching approaches, they return the eggs to their beach of origin. But sometimes these hatchlings can arrive a little bit ahead of schedule. Entonces pasa aquí al acuario por un día nada más porque ya en la noche el personal aquí hacemos las liberaciones. These hatchlings are only kept here if they're born in the morning. In part, this is because their instincts are to race toward the brightest horizon. And by night, the moon will better draw them toward the safety of the sea. These green preemies flap around their pool, learning to swim for the very first time. From the moment of birth, green turtles have four lateral plates on the outer sides of their shells. This helps to distinguish them from loggerhead turtles, which have five plates. This upper shell is also known as a dorsal carapace. Tortugraña volunteers watch over the hatchlings, like nursemaids, while trying to impart some wonder and respect for the turtles into the next generation. Children watching children. A veces eh, liberamos con los niños, les decimos que que no lo hagan para que ellos, las nuevas generaciones, vayan con esa cultura y que cuiden el animalito, porque la verdad es un animalito muy bonito que hay que cuidarlo. When those baby turtles are released, they'll instinctively race toward the ocean and toward those great floating sargassum mats. 
The green sea turtles, when they're small and when they're growing up, they're most likely feeding primarily on small organisms like small shrimps and, and other crustaceans and, and, and other uh, plankton organisms, possibly, that are also found among the sargassum. Um, so essentially, they're meat eaters, whereas later in life, they uh, turn into grazers. For these turtles and other creatures, the floating sargassum is a place of shelter and a place of sustenance. Warming waters and lesser winds are the reasons many scientists believe these increasing piles are coming to shore. But scientists still view this sargassum as a perfectly natural event. In fact, a positive event. When you go to the shore and you dig into a pile of seaweed that has been there for some weeks, you'll see a huge number of shrimps and, and other uh, crustaceans and organisms living in there, also worms and, and other invertebrates that then are food for birds and, and crabs and, and, and other organisms that uh, dig through there and, and fish them out. So it's almost like a little compost ecosystem developing on the beach. And in places like Punta Sur Eco Beach Park, sargassum is allowed to go all natural. Punta Sur is an ecological reserve on Cozumel Island, south of Isla Mujeres. Away from the postcard demands of the hotel industry, this sargassum fulfills its natural role unchecked. Sargassum has also been long known to possess healing properties. Some societies have used uh, seaweeds for a long time, including sargassum, as a, a potential herbal medicine or um, an ingredient in herbal medicines. As far back as the 8th century, Chinese medicine has used sargassum to treat fevers, thyroid problems, and skin conditions. On the beach, Sargassum also functions as a catch-all and a buffer, reducing wind and wave erosion. It shields the beach, allowing the area to develop dunes, and then back dunes, where renewable life can thrive. In this way, the brown algae not only protects the island's wildlife, but the physical structure of the island itself. Nestled in the back dunes is a bunker-like building, a Mayan ruin approximately a thousand years old. As a popular myth would have it, this structure functions as a sentinel for coming hurricanes. The building is known as the Tumba del Caracol, or the Shell Vault. In its design, it's said to resemble a conch shell. The persistent myth here is that when the great god Huracan would raise a gale, it would blow through this chamber like blowing on a conch. The vault then would produce a high whistling sound of warning, so those nearby might protect themselves. When the storm is coming, the sound is very strong for the people in, around the, the, this site, listen, and they know that the storm is coming. So that is a romantic version. Countering the romantic version is the reality. When Hurricane Wilma ripped through Cozumel, this little temple did nothing to protect the region. But an all-natural system along these Cozumel coasts did. Unfortunately, in 2005, 22 of October, we have one of the strongest hurricanes in the story of a human being, which is uh, Hurricane Wilma and uh, destroy a lot of red mangrove. That's why you see around, there's a lot of uh, red mangrove uh, dead. Hurricane Wilma is among the fiercest tropical cyclones ever recorded in the Atlantic Basin. But the red mangrove forests shielding Cozumel took the brunt of the storm. Without this natural savior, the damage to the island would have been profoundly worse. Red mangrove trees live in the juncture of land and sea and are adapted to tough intertidal conditions. Their great gnarly roots 
prop them above the high water line, so much so that they're called stilt roots. Where these knotty roots systems strong anchor into the mud, they also fortify the entire coastline. They protect from erosion and hold onto new sediments even when the strongest tides roll out. During a hurricane event, these rugged mangroves are critical. They function like natural windbreakers, reducing gale speeds, while also diminishing the impact of crashing waves. Some studies suggest mangroves can absorb an astounding 90% of a wave's energy during a tropical cyclone. But standing on the front lines can take its toll, making reforestation efforts like this necessary. But in a very real way, these mangroves help to protect the entire island. During hurricanes, it's estimated that for every mangrove patch the size of a football field, approximately 100,000 US dollars in property damage is stopped in its tracks. But damaged mangrove forests grow back very slowly. So where they once saved the people, now the people must save them. All these parts where the trees are dead, it takes probably 15 to 20 years to see it green again. But with every successfully germinated seed, the area comes another step toward being fruitful for the future. Healthy mangrove forests, like sargassum fields, are ripe nurseries for a wealth of young species. Among these mangrove roots, you might see blue crab, snook, snappers, and more. This reddish egret makes its home just beyond the red mangroves, in a habitat made safe by the tree's protective belt. The egret is a kind of heron, stalking its prey in a long-limbed rush. In order to reduce glare off the water, this bird shrugs its wings out wide, making it known as a canopy hunter. With a conservation status of threatened, the American crocodile also uses the mangrove forests as a place of refuge. And when the time comes, like its distant reptilian cousin, the sea turtle, the crocodile will lay its eggs in the cradling soft earth of the nearby beach. One of those nearby beaches, still within Cozumel's Punta Sur, is about to become a twilight staging area for the release of hatchling turtles. Like their colleagues from Isla Mujeres, the turtle salvation program here is made up of designated biologists and volunteers. They work to limit human activity on Cozumel's eastern-sided beaches during the nesting and hatching season. Here in Punta Sur, we have a sea turtle camp. So it's one of the most important uh, areas in the Caribbean for the tur turtle populations. The turtle salvation program identifies nested clutches in order to protect eggs from their natural predators. And here we might get to the 1,000 nest season. The program also tags mature females in order to collect scientific data regarding their feeding habits, migration patterns, and more. You can come here and see that you're doing something really important to take care of the turtles. And you can actually be with the turtle and help them 
I love doing here because, oh, well, this is my office right now, you know? It, it's, it's great. And when the day finally arrives, these volunteers preside over the release of the next generation of hatchlings. This clutch, freed from their spongy eggshells, still seem to be clutching to one another. A groggy ball of little lives. Just before twilight, more and more turtles bloom from the sands, rousing themselves and becoming more active. Es que ella entre más pronto la liberemos es mejor para ellas porque ellas están llenas de energía. Baby turtles instinctively know to aim themselves towards the setting sun or the moon as it shines across the water. For those first critical minutes, however, if a turtle scrambles inland, fooled by overlit human hotels or street lamps, then that turtle risks never making it to the ocean at all. Hatchlings can have their lives cut short during their very first hour by crocodiles, crabs, car wheels, and more. We don't have that many uh, constructions in this area, right? But it might affect uh, with the lights, that they are near, too close from the beach. The turtles guide for the, for the lights. In those beaches, they have programs for turtle protection. In the hotels, it's, uh, it's a rule that they have to protect the turtles. Happily, more and more Mexican beach developers are becoming aware of their protective responsibility. New government regulations, as of 2013, call for changing or eliminating any long-term light sources that disrupt the nesting beaches. Racing for the ocean's protective cover, these hatchlings still have their work cut out for them. Not even an hour old, and already learning how to hang 10. Having literally thrown themselves into the deep end, these baby turtles now instinctively strive for a place of safety in wide open waters. Heading for those sargassum nurseries fringing the Mexican coast. Sea turtles have really adapted to life in the sargassum fields, um, particularly at the early life stages. So the small turtles, they're basically like popcorn swimming in the ocean. Everybody can gobble them up. They're slow, they're tasty, and they need to find a safe place to hide. And the sargassum provides that for them. The stark truth is that only 1% of these hatchlings will ever survive long enough to reach sexual maturity. Under the sand, not every clutch of eggs will hatch. Neither will every egg within a clutch. And not every baby hatchling will make it to the edge of the beach. But Mother Nature has a way of turning even negatives into positives. These natural casualties will, in fact, renew the beach itself. Beach sand, on its own, is basically too fine to hold onto rich nutrients. But through shrugged off eggshells and unsuccessful hatchlings, turtles help replenish their place of birth. Bestowing primal nutrients back into the sand causes dune vegetation to flourish. Better dune vegetation causes root systems to flourish. 
anchoring the beach against bigger forces of erosion, just as the sargassum and the red mangrove forests do. This allows the entire ecosystem of plants and animals to grow more fertile. A rebirth. Two decades from now, the living beach will be here to welcome back some of these very same hatchlings. Grown to maturity, heavy now with their own eggs. Mothers in the garden of the earth goddess, Ishel. Into the 21st century, so I think we really have to step up efforts to maintain that ability of the living beach to um, not just be alive, but um, resilient to some of those challenges that are coming by climate change and increased pollution and increased populations of people who want to live near the coast. Every time when I take people around this lagoon, I, I tell them that we live in an island, but it's not called Cozumel. We live in an island which is called planet Earth. And then if we do something bad in one part, it will affect us. That's why here we have to do our best to protect this area. Nursing the turtle population back to health speaks to our caretaking for all Mother Earth so that she may continue to take care of us. There is another myth in Mayan folklore. In it, the origins of these gentle reptiles and our own origins remain forever intertwined. The story goes, long before human beings and long before the god Huracan blew the beaches and the lands into being, there was only the endless ocean and the entire world that contained it, that was carried across the heavens, born upon the back of a turtle.